Adhya, let's get started. I I I love I love that there's peace. Violence is the solution. We stop, then it starts again and again and again, and people are dying. It's finally over. The rocket fire between Israel and Hamas has ended. After 11 days of incessant fighting, they've agreed to a ceasefire. But does that mean peace? Not quite. For one, there's a narrative war that's going on. Both sides claim victory, and both sides are fighting to uphold their version of events. Who won? That's in the press and on social media. What about the situation on the ground? Fresh clashes are being reported in Jerusalem and elsewhere. The situation is still precarious. Yesterday, the violence was debated in the United Nations. Leaders and representatives from many countries spoke. Eventually, it was a peace negotiation brokered by Egypt that bore fruit. On Gravitas tonight, as we track the events and reactions, we will also discuss why this ceasefire is a mere band-aid on an old wound that continues to fester and bleed. For lasting, sustainable peace, a sincere effort is needed. And at the moment, no side seems keen on it. Also on the show tonight, as Wuhan virus cases drop, India battles a new epidemic. Black fungus infections are on the rise, treatments in short supply. India is working towards theatre commands, but will they be effective? What are the roadblocks? We bring you a special report on India's military reform. The BBC is being slammed for its deceitful interview of Princess Diana more than 25 years ago. British lawmakers demand reforms in the broadcaster. Young Britons want an end to the monarchy itself. And in Japan, a bullet train driver's bathroom break has made him the subject of international headlines. We'll tell you why. We begin, as always, with Gravitas Global Headlines. India's External Affairs Minister S.J. Shankar will begin a five-day visit to the U.S. next week with a focus on procurement of COVID-19 vaccines from American companies and explore the possibility of their joint production. Jay Shankar will hold talks with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and is also expected to meet U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres in New York. Russian President Vladimir Putin warns that Russians would knock out the teeth of those who attack their country or eye its vast territory amid a deep crisis in ties with the West. While Putin did not specify who these adversaries were, he said it was important to keep developing the armed forces. France's top constitutional authority says it had rejected a key article of a new security law that could see prosecutions of people who publish footage of police officers in action. Article is part of a security law drafted by President Macron's ruling party, which later sparked massive protests at the end of last year. U.S. President Joe Biden signs a bill to address a proliferation of assaults and violent crimes against Asian Americans since the outbreak of the pandemic. This bill amounts to the first legislative action that Congress has taken to bolster law enforcement's response to attacks on people of Asian descent during the pandemic. LGBTQ activist Luong Le Hui becomes the first openly gay candidate running for a seat in Vietnam's National Assembly in elections to be held on the 23rd of May. Hui is currently the director of a Vietnamese NGO and is one of nine independent candidates who made it to the ballot out of 76 self-nominated contenders. 
Scientists have discovered a new canine coronavirus in a child who was hospitalized with pneumonia in Malaysia in 2018. If the virus is confirmed to be a human pathogen, it will be the eighth coronavirus and the first canine coronavirus known to cause disease in humans. The study said it is not clear whether the specific virus poses a serious threat to humans. A skyscraper in southern China has been closed down for the foreseeable future after it caused panic when it started to shake earlier this week. The cause of the swaying is being investigated. The 300-meter ACG Plaza in Shenzhen began shaking a few days ago, prompting people inside and on the streets to flee. El Salvador officials said they were excavating graves discovered at the house of a former police officer that contained as many as 40 bodies, most of them believed to be women. The remains of at least 24 people have been recovered so far at the house while at least 10 people are facing charges, including a former police officer. Nikola Jokic, Joel Embiid and Stephen Curry have been named as the finalists for the NBA MVP award. Jokic had one of the best offensive seasons in the history of the league and led the Denver Nuggets to the third seed in the Western Conference. Fellow center Embiid posted the best season of his career as Philadelphia finished with the best record in the East. Golden State's Curry became the oldest scoring champion since Michael Jordan and is seeking his third MVP award. Colombia have been removed as co-hosts for next month Copa America. Ball has guaranteed that the 10-team tournament scheduled to be held from June the 13th to July the 11th will go ahead, but it is likely that all matches will now be held in Argentina. Colombia has been witnessing large-scale anti-government protests since last month, which have led to at least 15 deaths. India is fighting an epidemic within a pandemic. First, the Wuhan virus killed tens of thousands of people, continues to kill them, and now those who have recovered face the risk of a black fungus infection. How bad is the situation? We'll discuss in a bit. First, the latest numbers. New cases remain below the 300,000 mark. But India's total pandemic caseload has now crossed 26 million, 26 million infections since last year. Active cases are still falling. They dropped by more than 100,000 yesterday. So now India is reporting over 3 million active cases. Recoveries remain steady. More than 22 million people have recovered in India since last year. But once again, India has reported more than 4,000 deaths in a single day. Overall, close to 300,000 people have died since last year. 3 lakh deaths because of the Wuhan virus in India. This is the official figure. The world over, the official death toll is 3.4 million. 3.4 million people have died due to the Wuhan virus. This is according to data from the World Health Organization. But the WHO says that this may not be the accurate figure, the one that they're reporting, and that fatalities are being underreported worldwide. The actual figure, according to the WHO, could be two to three times higher seven to nine million people could have died worldwide. And this includes the underreported deaths from the Wuhan virus and the indirect deaths caused by factors like the lack of hospital capacity and restrictions on movement. Those patients who could not reach hospitals and were not registered. In 2020 alone, the WHO estimates that the Wuhan virus killed at least three million people. What do the official numbers say? 1.8 million fatalities. That's how much the gap is. We'll talk about black fungus in a bit. For the moment, let's talk about another big development. And as we fight the Wuhan virus, the key, we say, is to not lose hope. And that's true for any crisis, healthcare crisis, humanitarian, historical, because even the darkest of tunnels do come to an end. And that's the story from West Asia. Tensions between Israel and Hamas escalated two Fridays ago on the 7th of May, to be precise. Before one could take stock, 
a fight broke out, the worst since 2014. It lasted 11 days. It killed at least 255 people, 255. It kept the world on its toes. Here's a quick recap. In total, over 4,300 rockets were fired from Gaza, 4,300 into Israel. Israel bombarded the Gaza Strip. 243 people died in Gaza. More than 100 of them were women and children. In Israel, 12 people died, including an Indian woman and two Thai nationals. At one point, an all-out war seemed inevitable. But 11 days of non-stop violence later, the exchange of fire has finally ended. And I can finally tell you that Israel and Gaza have agreed to a ceasefire. Here's what happened in the last 24 hours. An emergency meeting of the United Nations General Assembly was called. On the agenda was the Israel-Gaza violence. Countries called for an immediate ceasefire. Israel equated Hamas to the Nazis. Palestinian Foreign Minister Raid al-Maliki addressed the assembly. And he questioned Israel's use of force. He called it a colonizing power. A little later, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced that his security cabinet had approved the Egyptian-mediated proposal to end violence, and Hamas quickly responded. It said that it would honor the deal. A ceasefire was announced. Celebrations broke out in Gaza, Jerusalem, and as far away as New York. The ceasefire came into effect at 2 a.m. local time. As the fight ended, a narrative war began. And it began with one question. Who won this 11-day-long battle? Both Israel and Gaza are claiming victory. In Gaza, there were cheers and whistles last night. Residents took to the streets and they were joined by senior Hamas officials. Listen to what one of them said. We are celebrating this victory now, so let the world listen why we are celebrating. Why are we coming out happily? Because many factors have emerged. The Zionist enemy wanted to impose new facts in Jerusalem and Sheikh Jarrah in our homeland Palestine. So Palestine rose up from its sea to the river, from its north to south, to be like one castle, one people in the face of this occupier. We are sacrificing for Palestine. We are sacrificing for Jerusalem al-Aqsa. <laughs> And what does Israel have to say? Let's have it from the horse's mouth. To the citizens of Israel, at the beginning of my speech, I would like to thank you for standing strong and for the outstanding strength that you have showed during the 11-day campaign that allowed us to accomplish the goals of the campaign with outstanding success. Not everything is known to the public. By the way, not everything is known to Hamas, but our overall achievements will become known over time. Hamas received 11 days and nights of big blows that changed the rules of the game. I want to emphasize that more than anything else, we changed the equation not only for the days of the campaign, we changed the equation for the future. Outstanding success. 
You've changed the equation for the future. Netanyahu's message is loud and clear. He says Israel has won. Meanwhile, a Hamas leader told the media that Israel has made a concession. It's a promise to, quote-unquote, lift their hand off Sheikh Jarrah and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Israel has denied this. You see, both Israel and Gaza are trying to tell the world that they have won. Like I said, it's a war of narratives. And it is being fought on numerous fronts. Social media is one of them. It has been quite a lethal battle in the last couple of weeks. Israel has tried to capitalize on its widely followed handles online. It has fired rockets on Twitter, literally. Put up emotionally charged messages. Palestinians, on the other hand, are capitalizing on the momentum gained from a viral campaign. Hashtag Save Sheikh Jarrah. The narrative war is also being fought on the streets. Over the weeks, there have been pro-Israel and pro-Palestine rallies in countries across the world. One such rally turned deadly today. In Pakistan, six people were killed in an explosion. Reports say the target was a local leader who was on his way to attend a pro-Palestine rally. Another weapon in this narrative war are speeches. What leaders from each side are telling the world. You already sampled it. Israel maintains that it is a nation under attack, a nation that is being forced to defend itself. As for Hamas, it claims to have exposed Israel. It claims to have shown the world how Israel does not mind killing women and children. This was the fourth time violence between Hamas and Israel escalated to such deadly heights. The good thing is, a ceasefire has finally been agreed on. And while a ceasefire is a start, an important start, it is not a permanent solution to a problem that is intertwined in history, geography, identity and religion. This region needs a resolution and unless there is one, West Asia will continue to be hit by repeated waves of violence. Let me show you something. These are images from earlier this evening. Clashes between Palestinians and Israelis have begun all over again and this time too, it is in Al-Aqsa. It is unclear what sparked this violence, but according to the latest, police have fired stun grenades and tear gas at these protesters. Some of the Palestinians hurled rocks there. And they were seen waving Hamas flags. sure you'll agree this is hardly anybody's idea of peace. Narrative wars will only give more ammunition to radical groups on either side. Peace deals alone do not ensure peace. For that, you need all stakeholders on board. And if the last 11 days have taught us anything, it is this. Let's come back to India. There's no peace from the pandemic here. The second wave is slowly subsiding, but another challenge has emerged. It is called black fungus. From reporting just a few cases last month, India has now been forced to declare this infection an epidemic. The situation is serious. Where are these cases being reported? What are the measures being taken? And what are the challenges in India's fight against the black fungus? Our next report explores. Our fight in black fungus इससे निपटने के लिए जरूरी सावधानी और व्यवस्था पर ध्यान देना जरूरी है। The Wuhan virus cases may be falling, but there's a new cause of worry: black fungus, scientifically known as mucormycosis. It is a complication associated with the virus. A few cases were reported in New Delhi last month with no loss of lives. Since then, the infection has killed at least 219 people. The case count has reached 7,250, with infections reported in at least 13 states and union territories. The worst hit are Maharashtra, Gujarat, 
मध्य प्रदेश हरियाणा दिल्ली उत्तर प्रदेश बिहार छत्तीसगढ़ कर्नाटक एंड तेलंगाना Given the scale of infections, the central government has directed all states to declare black fungus as an epidemic. The health ministry has asked them to list it under the Epidemic Diseases Act 1897, which basically means that every single confirmed or suspected case will directly have to be reported to the Union Health Ministry. All hospitals, state and private, will have to follow guidelines for screening, diagnosis, and management of cases. Are they prepared? not really several hospitals across india have reported a shortage of amphotericin b the medicine which is key to curing this infection the center says this shortage will be resolved soon so far six pharma companies were producing this drug and now the center has given permission to five more manufacturers it has also placed orders to import 6 lakh vials from abroad the rising cases and shortages have caused alarm but it is important to understand that the fungus doesn't infect everyone So far it has only been reported in some covid-19 survivors doctors blame the panic use of steroids which made it easier for this fungal infection to spread but how does it spread mucormycosis is caused by a group of moles called mucormycetes these moles exist freely throughout the environment people get infected when they come in contact or breathe in these fungal moles so who is the most vulnerable According to the Indian Council of Medical Research, four kinds of people, those who use steroids during their covid treatment and end up with lower immunity, those who had prolonged stays at hospital ICUs and are yet to recover, those with diabetes or a history of kidney and heart failure, and those who are on medication for major health problems that reduces their ability to fight pathogens. What are the symptoms? Pain under the eyes, one-sided facial swelling, nasal or sinus congestion black lesions on the nasal bridge stuffy or bleeding nose toothache or loosening of teeth and partial loss of vision how do you protect yourself from such an infection experts advise the following steps wear a mask at all times wear shoes long trousers and preferably gloves if you step out into a park or for gardening and maintain personal hygiene including a thorough scrub bath As infections rise, India must focus on precautions, judicious use of steroids, and immediate treatment where the fungus is detected. Bureau report: We on World is one. India is grappling with the virus from China and the new complications it has caused. Meanwhile, China is capitalizing on India's crisis. It has wrapped up construction of a strategic highway in Tibet. a highway that is very close to the indian state of arunachal pradesh this highway has been under construction for 7 years now china has spent 310 million dollars on this project it passes through a grand canyon of the brahmaputra on the tibetan side and this highway will improve china's access to remote areas on the disputed border with arunachal pradesh this is the highway that china has completed construction of right now And while China picks up arms over India's road construction in Ladakh, it continues to build such strategic assets along the Indian border. This highway is just a small component of China's grand plan for Tibet. Xi Jinping has ordered a major infrastructure push. It involves building roads, highways, villages, and military outposts. Let me show you something. Two case studies in the form of satellite images. They are from northern Bhutan. These pictures were clicked on two separate dates. The first set is from December 2003. It shows no construction activity. The second set is from January 2021 this year. It shows a road connecting Tibet to a district in Bhutan and a village. The village is called Gyala Phug. This is one of the three villages that China has built inside Bhutanese territory. So these are Chinese villages inside Bhutan. two are already occupied as for the first as of the first week of may in fact one was under construction and these villages have everything i have a list of what they have 66 miles of new roads a small hydro power station two communist party administrative centers a communication base a disaster relief warehouse five outposts that could be military or police 
These villages have everything to serve as a military base for China. They have security sites, they have signal towers, a military base and even a satellite receiving station. And all of this has been built in the far north of Bhutan. China claims that these are areas that are part of Tibet. What you see now are pictures from last year. The man on your screen is a Communist Party secretary for Tibet. He traveled to meet the Tibetan villagers in this village, Gyala Fug. And he told the villagers to, quote unquote, raise the bright five star red flag high. That's the Chinese flag. And he's talking about raising the Chinese flag in Bhutanese territory. And if you haven't figured it out by now, China is taking its South China Sea strategy to the Himalayas. It is building structures to claim disputed territory. In the South China Sea, Beijing has fortified and armed shoals claimed by Vietnam and the Philippines. They're doing the same in the mountains. It has built a highway near Arunachal Pradesh and villages in Bhutan. China wants to do more such construction work along the Tibetan border. In fact, they've released a new policy paper on Tibet. What does it say? It reveals how Beijing has pumped money into construction activity on the border. Reports from 2019 say that China had plans to build 624, quote unquote, well-off villages and farms on Tibet's borders. By 2020, China said many of the border villages were better connected to highways. And all such villages have access to mobile communication. So we have a highway near Arunachal Pradesh and Chinese villages in Bhutanese territory. All of this construction activity is China's attempt to unilaterally change facts on the ground through encroachment and colonization. So pandemic or not, China is not backing down and India needs to watch out. Which brings us to the Indian military. You can track history through the evolution of warfare. Gone are the days when battles dragged on for years. Today's battles are instant. It's all about striking swiftly and stealthily. And to do this, you need to check two boxes. One is instant decision making and the second is state of the art weaponry. Tonight we tell you where India stands on these two indicators. How does the chain of command work in India? Is there scope for improvement? And what about our weapons? Can they keep up with the rest of the world? Let's talk about the chain of command first. India's defense is split into three services. You may know that. The Air Force, the Navy and the Army. And they have their own headquarters, their own bases, their own leadership. It's been this way for decades. But this system has drawbacks. There's a lot of duplication of work. Unnecessary bureaucracy. Let me explain with an example. The Indian airspace is defended by all three services. They are tracking threats on separate frequencies with their own radars. But here's the problem. Every army headquarters is located next to an airbase. So two agencies are doing the same work sitting right next to each other. Think about the wastage of resources and manpower. I'll give you another example. Imagine the army is on a combing operation. The in charge, the commander in charge, wants some air support. So he calls up the Air Force, which in turn will then churn this request through its ranks. Do you see the problem here? The person in charge of an operation does not have complete control over the assets. And this was the story every time India went to war. The Air Force had its own plan, the Army was doing its own thing, but modern war machines cannot function like this and India is realizing this. The defense establishment is moving towards what is called theaterization. This is how the US and China organize their forces. In India, there is talk of five commands. The Northern Command to deal with China, the Western Command on the Pakistani side, a Peninsula Command in Southern India, a Maritime Command to patrol the seas and an Air Defense Command to protect the airspace. Five commands for India. How is this different from the current setup? The commandos are, unif the commands in fact are unified establishments, which means that the Army, the Navy and the Air Force will function together under one command. No more shuttling between agencies for orders. All three services will answer to a single commander. 
In military circles, they call this jointness and integration. But will this work in India? We put this question to retired Rear Admiral Rakesh Chopra earlier today. He says jointness is as much about the mindset as the organization. Served in the uh, uh, IDSC, Integrated Defense Headquarters, and uh, you know it, it, it is a marvelous concept, provided we take it to its logical conclusion. You need people who think jointly. That's the main problem. You need people who can look at the problem from a, from a joint perspective. And this can only come if you have people who have served in, in joint appointments. We've, you know, had, even starting from the, from the NDA to the Staff College, et cetera, et cetera, to the NDC, to certain formations which are joint, which have got all assets, all of the three services, then people can understand. But if you have a, a if you have people looking after their own turf, then this, of course, will not come. So the Integrated Defense Headquarters is the ideal place for jointness to start. India cannot underestimate this mindset problem. The three services are used to autonomy. So we cannot assume that they will get along on cue. Both the Air Force and the Navy fear that the Army will dominate joint commands. This could lead to a turf war, a territorial battle for assets, for funds, for influence. The other big challenge is logistics. If you appoint a commander, what happens to the chiefs of staff? Do the soldiers still report to them or will commanders take over operational control? Same with the assets. The Air Force has only 31 squadrons. Can they spread their assets wide enough to support every command? These are some of the big challenges to joint theatres. How do we handle them? How do others handle them? The United States, for instance. It has a tried and tested system, but India cannot copy the American system. India's tri-service chief has ruled this out. General Bipin Rawat says India will develop in its own system of joint theatres. So what is it going to look like? The military is tight-lipped about the plans, but reports say they should be operational by next year. And hopefully this will solve the bottlenecks in decision-making. What about the weapons? An army, we are told, is only as good as the weapons it has. And this is where India has struggled in the past with outdated weapons, aircraft and ships. The only way to overhaul this is through defence spending. Now on paper, India is the third largest spender in the world behind the United States and China. But it's not about how much you spend, it's about where you spend that money. Look at the breakup of India's defence budget. 50% of the funds go to salaries and pensions. So at the start of every month, half the money is already gone. Where does that leave India's modernization plans? These are figures from this year's budget. The total allocation was 4.78 lakh crore rupees. After pensions and salaries and other expenses, guess how much is left for modernization? 1.35 lakh crore rupees, just 28% of the total budget. For a country with two belligerent neighbors, this is simply inadequate. So what are India's options here? One is to keep expanding the defense bill. But as this pandemic has shown us, India needs to put more money in public health and infrastructure too at the moment. So a big defense bill could be highly unpopular given the circumstances. What about reforming pensions? Maybe extend the retirement age of officers. Every time someone suggests this, there's a backlash from veterans. And the situation is not getting any better. We need active deployments in the East and West, which means more soldiers, more salaries, more pensions. Where will all of this money come from? A viable option then is to trim the loose ends, streamline acquisitions, cut down on duplication of work. So I come back to jointness and integration. Right now, every service has its own wish list. There is no synergy between them on acquisitions. The goal is to get them all together so that India's defense establishment has one wish list, not three. This is the, this is the job of the Integrated Defense Headquarters, to have a look at these wish lists. And then to, because there, and these are all officers from the three services, to discuss and see what is really necessary and make priorities, in consultation with the services, of course. You see, if we only have a mechanism provided, we let we let the mechanism work. That is the question, you know. 
and it's just not uh, that I, you know, so and so service wants so and so thing, and therefore, you know, it it, uh, it, it sort of bamboozled, bamboozled everybody else. But all decisions on procurement, etc., should ideally be passed through the integrated defence headquarters. All of this is easier said than done, of course. The bureaucrats are sure to oppose a unified command. They hate being sidelined. Also, be ready for squabbles between generals, admirals and air marshals, perhaps. But these worries should not concern India very much because unification of command is like a rebirth for the military. Every big power has gone through it and they're better off with the new system. The Wuhan virus came from a laboratory. This theory is as old as the pandemic. And after 17 months, we still don't know if it's true or not. But the lab leak theory refuses to die. More arguments backing this claim keep coming up, and each one is better than the other. This time, a probe by the Republicans in the US and a story from a prominent science writer are raising the same question. Is China trying to hide something about the Wuhan lab? Here's a report. Do you think that the COVID-19 virus came from a lab in Wuhan? I do, and have for quite some time. That voice was of Mike Pompeo, the former U.S. Secretary of State. Pompeo has no doubt that the virus escaped from a lab in Wuhan. When Pompeo was in charge of the State Department, his office released this fact sheet. It said that researchers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology had fallen ill in the autumn of 2019. This was well before China reported its first case. And all these months and investigations later, Pompeo still believes that a leak did happen. If you stare at the evidence that is accumulated to date, it points in the single direction of this having been a laboratory leak from a place called the Wuhan Institute of Virology. This claim is not new. What about the evidence? Can anyone prove a lab leak? Republican lawmakers say there is circumstantial proof that merits a full and credible investigation. They have released a report asking the US government to put more pressure on China for a probe. And it's not just politicians. Many scientists and researchers agree that the lab theory must be investigated. Nicholas Wade is a prominent science writer. He recently authored a detailed assessment for the Bulletin of Atomic Sciences. The piece explores every angle and assesses all possibilities. Wade believes that neither a natural outbreak nor the lab theory should be ruled out. And going by the evidence that's available, a lab leak looks much more plausible. Nicholas Wade lists several events that put a question mark on the role of the Wuhan lab in his piece. He shares how researchers at the Wuhan lab collected hundreds of bad coronaviruses and how they were doing gain-of-function experiments. This is research designed to make coronaviruses infect human cells and humanized mice. Here is where the role of Peter Daszak comes into question. Daszak is the president of EcoHealth Alliance, an American organization that funded research into coronaviruses at the Wuhan lab in China. In the early days of the pandemic, 27 prominent public health scientists had signed this letter. They rejected theories that suggested the Wuhan virus was not natural in its origin. In his piece, Nicholas Wade claims that Daszak had organized and drafted this letter, and while doing so, he did not disclose his own links to the Wuhan lab. Daszak claims that the charges against him are disingenuous and wildly erroneous. His organization, the EcoHealth Alliance, received funding from America's National Institute of Health the same body that is headed by Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Fauci himself has recently faced questions over the funding that America gave to the Wuhan lab. While EcoHealth Alliance and the Wuhan lab did get American money, Fauci maintains that the funding was not for any gain-of-function research. In recent weeks, the fresh claims and new connections have caught the eye of more experts. 18 scientists have now written an open letter demanding a new probe into the origins of the Wuhan virus. The doubts can only be settled if China gives unfettered access to the Wuhan lab. And that is wishful thinking. Laboratory or not, the virus came out of China. 
it turned into a pandemic because China hid the facts. It lied to the world and kept world bodies in the dark till it was too late. All of this has been documented. Instead of making amends, China then tried to profiteer from the pandemic. Chinese manufacturers sold faulty testing kits to the world, including to India. And it's happening all over again, the profiteering. As India struggles with the surge, the second wave, Chinese companies have jacked up the prices of essential medical supplies. And the Chinese state sees no problem with any of this. The prices of all kinds of supplies have gone up, from raw materials for drugs to oxygen concentrators. In some cases, the prices have shot up by as much as 300%. Oxygen concentrators, for instance, they're usually listed online for 1,000 yuan. That's 11,000 Indian rupees. Right now, they're selling for as much as five times the price. Same for raw materials for medicines. Prices for essential ingredients have gone up by 30 to 40 percent, and this includes raw materials for paracetamol that's used for fever and azithromycin, which is an antibiotic. The cost of ingredients to make ivermectin has shot up by as much as 300 percent in one case. 300% jump. Studies claim that this drug does not help in the fight against the Wuhan virus, but the demand for ivermectin is still high, so Chinese suppliers are selling the raw materials for this drug at a premium. Last week, an Indian diplomat shared her concerns with the press. The Consul General to Hong Kong said soaring prices and cargo flight disruptions are slowing the arrival of medical goods in India. New Delhi's message was clear. Even at a time when the demand was high, there needs to be some predictability. Prices cannot shoot up randomly. What was China's response? It is blaming India for what's happening. The Chinese foreign ministry said the market is free to decide the prices. And since Indian buyers are reaching out for supplies through several channels, the multiple requests are causing the prices to go up. Taking oxygen generators as an example, the rising demand affects the global supply chain and there are some raw materials such as those that need to be imported from Europe and the lack of those supply has brought impact to production capacity. In addition, Indian buyers usually expressed their demand through a variety of channels. Sometimes procurement through different channels may also over amplify the demand to a certain extent and thus affect affects the order of the market and push up the price. Do you see what just happened there? That was China, a communist country, lecturing India about how the free market works. What Beijing is actually trying to say here is this. Had New Delhi reached out directly for help to Beijing, the prices could have been controlled. Remember, Chinese President Xi Jinping wrote a letter to India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi. He offered help to India. But India had not sought Chinese help. India is not asking for Chinese help. Medical supplies are being bought privately, bought. So Chinese suppliers are extorting Indian buyers. And the Chinese state is looking the other way. One interview is making headlines today. It is 26 years old. The interview was first aired in 1995. It was Princess Diana speaking to the BBC. More than two decades later, the interview is back in the news. Turns out the BBC had tricked Diana into giving this interview. How did they do it? We'll tell you in a bit. But first, I want to show you the impact of this disclosure. Just take a look at how British papers and tabloids have been smeared with Prince William and Prince Harry's anger. The Sun's headline reads... BBC let down my mum, my family in Britain. The Daily Telegraph, BBC fueled my mother's paranoia. The Daily Express, BBC lies ruined mum's life. The British Broadcasting Company, the BBC, as we know it, has its integrity hanging by a thread. Here's why. The 1995 interview was conducted by BBC journalist Martin Bashir. In the interview, Diana addressed a lot of personal issues. She spoke about Prince Charles' relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles. When asked whether Miss Parker Bowles was a factor in the breakdown of a marriage, Diana said that famous line, well, there are three of us in this marriage, so it is, it was a bit crowded. Diana also spoke about her struggles with bulimia, about mental health, about hurting herself. Let me read out an excerpt from that interview. And I'm quoting, 
when no one listens to you or you feel no one's listening to you all sorts of things start to happen for instance you have so much pain inside yourself that you try and hurt yourself on the outside because you want help at the time when the interview was aired 20 million people in britain 20 million watched it in 1995 and it came at the cost of the royal family what people could not figure out was why a former royal was washing dirty linen in public let alone speak about the future king's affairs Soon, Diana's brother claimed that this journalist, Martin Bashir, had deceived the family. So BBC ordered an investigation in 1996. This investigation cleared Bashir of any wrongdoing. Critics were not convinced, though. Demands for another investigation grew. But the BBC dragged its feet. Decades later, a retired judge named John Dyson was roped in to probe this interview. And six months later, he published a report. And here's what it says. BBC journalist Martin Bashir used deceit to win the interview with Diana. He showed fake bank statements to Diana's brother, Earl Spencer. Why did he do that? To induce him to arrange the meeting with Princess Diana. Did the BBC know about this? The Dyson report says the state broadcaster covered up the deception and was quote-unquote woefully ineffective in investigating Bashir's actions. Prince William has blasted the BBC. He's accused the broadcaster of influencing what Diana said. It is my view that the deceitful way the interview was obtained substantially influenced what my mother said. The interview was a major contribution to making my parents' relationship worse and has since hurt countless others. It brings indescribable sadness to know that the BBC's failures contributed significantly to her fear, paranoia and isolation that I remember from those final years with her. Prince Harry too issued a statement. The BBC was not mentioned, but here's what it said. To those who have taken some form of accountability, thank you for owning it. That is the first step towards justice and truth. What does the BBC have to say? It has offered a full and unconditional apology. BBC Director General Tim Davies said, and I'm quoting, The process for securing the interview fell far short of what audiences have a right to expect. The BBC should have made greater effort to get, the, get to the bottom of what happened at the time and been more transparent about what it knew. While the BBC cannot turn back the clock, after a quarter of a century, we can make a full and unconditional apology. The BBC offers that today. The BBC's former chairman, Lord Grade, is calling this the worst chapter in the broadcaster's history. It's a, one of the worst chapters in the BBC's history, in my view. Um, there's two issues. There's the rogue reporter uh, who gets the one of the world's greatest scoops by means of deception, not acceptable, and a scandal. Uh, the BBC's failure to get to the bottom of that, but worse still, and the most serious aspect of it, is the cover-up that followed. Cultural BBC journalism is that we, we, we're never wrong, uh, and that's the default position. And the BBC believes that if you own up to your mistakes early on, uh, it's a sign of weakness. It isn't actually, it's a sign of strength. And that's a cultural flaw deep in the heart of BBC journalism. Cultural flaw, he says. What is the solution? The BBC is, after all, a state broadcaster. If there is weakness and a cultural flaw in the network, then the government must press changes. The Minister of Media in the United Kingdom says the BBC needs reform. Does British Prime Minister Boris Johnson agree? I am obviously concerned by the findings of Lord Dyson's uh, report. I'm very grateful to him for, uh, for what he's done. I can only imagine the feelings of the, of the royal family. And uh, I hope very much that the BBC will be taking every possible step to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again. While the government wants reforms, the younger generation in the UK seems to want a republic. They're not concerned about the monarchy or its scandals. A YouGov survey found that 41% of those aged between 18 to 24 think that the UK should have an elected head of state. 
only 31% of this age group want a king or a queen. Two years ago, the monarchy found 46% support in the same age group. So what has changed? What happened in the last two years? And don't rewind 600 days. It's not worth it. Let's go back to March 2021. The YouGov survey comes after Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's interview. The one in which Meghan Markle spoke about her mental health and about racism in the British royal family. Just like 1995, this time too, an interview seems to have come at the cost of the royal family. Japan is regarded as a land of punctuality. Being late is simply not an option there. On most occasions, this is a great quality. But sometimes in the race to be punctual, people take great risks. They even put others' lives on the line. Our next report talks about one such instance. A bullet train driver in Japan took a toilet break at 155 kilometers per hour. That's the speed of the train. He got caught because his unscheduled break delayed the train by a minute. Here in India, we don't have to worry about this sort of things. Trains running late is the norm. And if they're on time, that's when you should be worried. <laughs> Jokes aside, India can definitely use punctuality as a lesson from Japan. But this particular driver may not be the best teacher. Take a look. When nature calls, you oblige. It's as simple as that. But what if nature catches you off guard? What if nature calls on you while driving a bullet train? A train running at 300 kilometers per hour. Tricky, isn't it? But that's exactly what happened to this driver in Japan. And unfortunately for him, he chose to answer the call. His story unfolded last weekend. A Shinkansen bullet train is hurtling down the Tokyo-Osaka line. On board are 160 passengers. Up ahead, in the cabin, things are about to get complicated. The driver is suddenly hit by a bout of stomach ache. A trip to the washroom appears inevitable. So what does he do? Leave the controls with an untrained conductor and dash to the washroom. For three minutes, the conductor was in the driver's seat. He didn't touch the controls. But the train kept pulling ahead at 150 kilometers per hour. The driver almost got away with his toilet break, but Japan's famous obsession with punctuality tripped him up. The train was one minute late, so authorities opened an investigation into the driver. And what did they find? His unscheduled toilet break. The driver's actions have been deemed extremely inappropriate. He's facing disciplinary action. Now, the obvious question is, what do you do if nature calls while driving a bullet train? Well, there is an established procedure. You inform the operations center and hand over controls to a trained conductor. This driver says he was embarrassed to report his sickness. This isn't the first time bullet train drivers have gone rogue. Mind you, this is rogue in the Japanese sense. 2018, a train left the station 25 seconds before schedule. Japan's National Railway called it inexcusable. The driver ended up apologizing. 2017, a Tsukaba Express conductor left 20 seconds before departure. Sacrilege, said the Japanese. While Japan's obsession with punctuality is commendable, we must ask, where do we draw the line? Being on time at any cost could mean paying a tall price. Because the next toilet break may not end the same. Bureau Report, we on. World is one. For us, it's time to wrap up the show. As always, we're leaving you with Gravitas Images. Thanks very much for watching. Have a good weekend. Stay safe.
Bueno, esto es un robot colaborativo, ¿vale? Las que no quieran. Las que no quieran nos las mandan. ¿Cómo te cuesta?